Chapter Twenty Four of Mary, a Fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter Twenty Four. Mary still continued weak and low, though it was spring and all nature began to look gay. With more than usual brightness the sun shone, and a little robin, which she had christened during the winter, sung one of his best songs. The family were particularly civil this fine morning, and tried to prevail on her to walk out. Anything like kindness melted her. She consented. Softer emotions banished her melancholy, and she directed her steps to the habitation she had rendered comfortable. Emerging out of a dreary chamber, all nature looked cheerful. When she had last walked out, snow covered the ground, and bleak winds pierced her through and through. Now the hedges were green, the blossoms adorned the trees, and the birds sung. She reached the dwelling without being much exhausted, and while she rested there, observed the children sporting on the grass with improved complexions. The mother, with tears, thanked her deliverer, and pointed out her comforts. Mary's tears flowed not only from sympathy, but a complication of feelings and recollections. The affections which bound her to her fellow creatures began again to play and reanimated nature. She observed the change in herself, tried to account for it, and wrote with her pencil a rhapsody on sensibility. Sensibility is the most exquisite feeling of which the human soul is susceptible. When it pervades us, we feel happy, and could at last unmixed, we might form some conjecture of the bliss of those paradisiacal days, when the obedient passions were under the dominion of reason, and the impulses of the heart did not need correction. It is this quickness, this delicacy of feeling, which enables us to relish the sublime touches of the poet and the painter. It is this which expands the soul, gives an enthusiastic greatness mixed with tenderness, when we view the magnificent objects of nature, or hear of a good action. The same effect we experience in the spring, when we hail the returning sun, and the consequent renovation of nature, when the flowers unfold themselves and exhale their sweets, and the voice of music is heard in the land. Softened by tenderness, the soul is disposed to be virtuous. Is any sensual gratification to be compared to that of feelings the eaves moistened after having comforted the unfortunate? Sensibility is indeed the foundation of all our happiness, but these raptures are unknown to the depraved sensualist, who is only moved by what strikes his gross senses. The delicate embellishments of nature escape his notice, as do the gentle and interesting affections. But it is only to be felt, it escapes discussion. Then she returned home and partook of the family meal, which was rendered more cheerful by the presence of a man, past the meridian of life, of polished manners and dazzling wit. He endeavored to draw Mary out and succeeded. She entered into conversation, and some of her artless flights of genius struck him with surprise. He found she had a capacious mind, and that her reason was as profound as her imagination was lively. She glanced from earth to heaven, and caught the light of truth. Her expressive countenance showed what passed in her mind, and her tongue was ever the faithful interpreter of her heart. Duplicity never threw a shade over her words or actions. Mary found him a man of learning, and the exercise of her understanding would frequently make her forget her griefs, when nothing else could except benevolence. This man had known the mistress of the house in her youth. Good nature induced him to visit her. But when he saw Mary, he had another inducement. Her appearance, and above all her genius, and cultivation of mind, roused his curiosity. But her dignified manners had such an effect on him, he was obliged to suppress it. He knew men as well as books. His conversation was entertaining and improving. In Mary's company he doubted whether heaven was peopled with spirits masculine, and almost forgot that he had called the sex the pretty playthings that render life tolerable. He had been the slave of beauty, the captive of sense. Love he ne'er had felt. The mind never riveted the chain, nor had the purity of it made the body appear lovely in his eyes. He was humane, despised meanness, but was vain of his abilities, and by no means a useful member of society. He talked often of the beauty of virtue, but— not having any solid foundation to build the practice on, he was only a shining or rather a sparkling character, and though his fortune enabled him to hunt down pleasure, he was discontented. Mary observed his character and wrote down a train of reflections, which these observations led her to make. These reflections received a tinge from her mind. The present state of it was that kind of painful quietness which arises from reason clouded by disgust. She had not yet learned to be resigned. Vague hopes agitated her. There are some subjects that are so enveloped in clouds, as you dissipate one, another overspreads it. Of this kind are our reasonings concerning happiness. 
till we are obliged to cry out with the apostle that it hath not entered into the heart of man to conceive in what it would consist or how satiety could be prevented man seems formed for actions though the passions are seldom properly managed they are either so languid as not to serve a spur or else so violent as to overleap all bounds every individual has its own peculiar trials and anguish in one shape or other visits every heart sensibility produces flights of virtue and not curbed by reason is on the brink of vice talking and even thinking of virtue christianity can afford just principles to govern the wayward feelings and impulses of the heart every good disposition runs wild if not transplanted into this soil but how hard it is to keep the heart diligently though convinced that the issues of life depend on it it is very difficult to discipline the mind of a thinker or reconcile him to the weakness the inconsistency of his understanding and still a more laborious task for him to conquer his passions and learn to seek content instead of happiness good dispositions and virtuous propensities without the light of the gospel produce eccentric characters comet-like they are always in extremes while revelation resembles the laws of attraction and produces uniformity but too often is the attraction feeble and the light so obscured by passion as to force the bewildered soul to fly into void space and wander in confusion end of chapter twenty four